Next up, we have Ivan Velekovic talking about the SEL4 microkit. So I'm supposedly a systems engineer at Trustworthy Systems at UNSW. Um, I primarily work on SEL4 microkit and the surrounding ecosystem. Um, so today we'll be introducing what the microkit is, um, briefly discussing it as well as the status of it. Um, and then the second part of the talk will basically just be the, the ecosystem that's building around it. Um, so what actually is MicroKit? There's been a bunch of people mentioning it so far. It's an operating systems framework for building systems on SEO4. Cool, what does that mean? Um, everyone has been saying they have one of those. Um, well, the primary, primary motivation is to lower the barrier to entry to developing on SEO4. So that was the whole you know, point of creating it. Um, before you even start you know, even getting a hello world working with SEO4, um, there are a bunch of things that you need in place. Um, and so this creates naturally a high barrier to entry. And even once you do have that, like the API is still uh, very low level. And so it does, you do need some abstraction um, to help with that. Um, so while the whole point of it was to make SEO4 easier to use, we still want to uphold the desirable properties of SEO4, such as performance, security, memory efficiency. Um, so this means that the abstractions that we do provide should be few, minimal, um, uh, and minimal abstractions over SEO4 primitives. Um, and finally, um, in order to do this, uh, we do have to have some limitations intentionally. And so the main one here is targeting cyber physical embedded systems, um, especially with static architecture. So this doesn't mean that Dynamicism will be completely absent, um, but it does mean that things like you know all the resources for the lifetime of a system are going to be known at build time. Um, so that's one thing to stress. Before I continue and start talking about why MicroKit uh, or about MicroKit, uh, why 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 did we change the name? Well, some people made a good point that the core and SEO4 core platform makes it look like the only framework to build SEO4 systems on, which is obviously not true. Over the past day, we've seen a number of different frameworks with different uh, you know, purposes um, that aren't necessarily overlapping with the microkit. Um, yeah. Uh, now, I understand that people have been using the SEO4 um, microkit already and referring it to the SEO4 core platform. But as a supposedly trying to make good software, I have thought about this, and I have developed a highly specialized tool to rename <laughs> all references to it. The source code is there for everyone. Um, of course, I'm just kidding. But if you do spot, I have tried my best to rename all uh, the main repository um, and associated projects. Um, that's still ongoing. If you find stuff, please let us know, just anyway. Um, so to start off, uh, I'm going to talk about the few abstractions that we do have. And the core of these uh, abstractions is protection domains. So this is just an environment for executing uh, user-level code. So um, unlike uh, you know, a typical Unix process or something, there is no main entry point. We have three entry points in, in it. Uh, for initialization, notified, protected for event handling. This will become clearer in a sec. Um, protection domains are all single-threaded right now with their own uh, address spaces. So uh, what this means in SEO4 terms is each PD contains its own capability space, its own virtual address space, and its own you know, TCB. It's not sharing anything with any other uh, protection domain by default. And so if you have a protection domain by default, all it can do is execute its own code and nothing else. So this is for um, isolation purposes. Um, if you have two PDs, they're not sharing any resources, then you know that um, because of the guarantees SEO4 provides that they are actually isolated. Um, and the final thing to mention is that the execution of a protection domain is event-based. So what this means is that um, there's no you know, concurrent execution in a protection domain. What happens is uh, after it starts, after it runs its initialization function, uh, it is just waiting for events to come in from uh, external sources, so other protection domains or hardware interrupts, so on. Um, yeah, there's no there's no such thing as you know just polling, waiting for things to happen. So this is done for efficiency as well as I guess, a philosophical design decision. Um, 
the next abstraction is memory regions. Um, so this is fairly simple. It's just we need a way of representing a continuous block of memory, especially since we need to know all the memory in the system before we even start the program, right? Because we, are, we do have a static architecture. Um, so this is either regular memory that you'd use for a shared buffer or something, or device memory for when you need to actually access a device when writing a device driver. Um, and obviously these can be mapped into a single PD or multiple PDs if you want to sh share uh, data across the protection domains um, for you know, zero copy communication and so on. Um, and of course, you can specify caching attributes and permissions like you'd expect. The last abstraction is communication channels. So we need an explicit way of knowing that two PDs can communicate to each other. Um, and so a communication channel allows for bidirectional uh, communication between two PDs. Um, so this is for both synchronous and asynchronous communication, right? Um, so notifications, which, you know, that's just an SEO4 primitive, are used for asynchronous communication. So that's when, um, let's say, if you had a uh, client um, a signal, some event has occurred uh, to another PD, um, and so interrupts are also delivered as notifications. Um, Protective procedure calls allow for synchronous communication. So if you have a client um, that wants to talk to some ser server to invoke some service and wait for a result uh, in a blocking fashion, you would use a protective procedure call. To summarize this briefly in a very simple example, um, let's say we have a client and a driver. Um, here we have a driver which has access to some device memory via memory region. Um, it writes to the device, then it gets an interrupt which gets uh, invokes SEO4, which then gets delivered as a notification. It handles that. Um, maybe it's a request from the client that has now completed, so it can notify the client that something has happened and so on. Um, so this is you know, a very simple example that's actually making use of all the abstractions that we have. Um, now that we have some idea of the abstractions, I'm going to talk a little bit about, I guess, the design or the workflow of MicroCut. Um, so Nick alluded to this a bit. Um, in his talk, but here, when we describe all of our resources at build time, we use a system description format um, written in XML. Um, so you would describe all the PDs you have in the system, the memory regions, the communication channels, and so on. Um, this is deliberate. Uh, you can go both ways. So you can either pass the XML to um, gain more introspection of the system, um, or you can auto-generate the, the system description, right? So that's the whole point of doing it in XML. It's just an easy way to facilitate that. Um, the thing I'm trying to allude to is that this allows you to build more abstract systems over MicroKit if you want to, especially for more complex systems. It might be something you need to do, um, and has been done in the past, actually. So in addition to providing the STF, the, the MicroKit tool, um, also takes in a bunch of ALFs of all the PDs in the system, right? Um, so it intentionally does not provide any build system to the user. It doesn't care how you build the ALFs. They just need to be valid ALFs that link with libmicrokit. So libmicrokit is providing the API over SEO4 system calls, as well as um, the event handler that I talked about before. So it's the one that's actually waiting on events and then calling the user provided notified procedure, protected procedure, and so on. And the final point to make is MicroKit is distributed as an SDK. So the point of this, again, is for user experience. It's so that nobody has to build you know, the various components, such as the initial task, the kernel, libmicrokit, and so on. So that concludes introducing MicroKit. I'm now going to talk about the status of MicroKit because a lot has happened over the past year. Um, the first thing is that actually last week, um, like the Rust support, the MicroKit RFC was approved by the SEO4 Foundation. And so now it is an official SEO4 project. It's been moved over to the SEO4 um, repositories, which is great. Um, in terms of the actual development that's been happening over the past year, that includes things like limited dynamicism. So I talked about a bit before, like stopping, restarting, and late loading PDs. We still have a static architecture, so you'd know how many PDs are in the system before running it, um, but you may 
have some situation where you say have a pool of PDs that you dispatch work to or something like that. Um, you, this will also enable you to do like live upgrades of um, uh, certain protection domains. Um, there's a new abstraction, which are virtual machines. They're very similar to prediction domains. Um, I'm not. I'm going to go into that in a sec. Uh, support for other architectures like RISC-V and x86-64. Um, this is in progress and maturing, and a lot more hardware platforms just to make it easier for everyone to get started on it. Uh, CapDL integration. Uh, so to eventually connect microkits with existing SEL4 proofs and infrastructure, uh, we want the tool to also be able to emit CapDL and use a CapDL initializer to start the system. Um, and like Gernot mentioned yesterday in his talk, there is a verification story that is implemented, uh, but of course there's still a little bit more work to do for that. And the process of upstreaming you know, all these changes, which is you know, a couple hundred commits by now, uh, has started um, as of last week with moving the repository, um, and I'll be doing that over the course of the next, I guess, couple months to hopefully get rid of any notion of a development version of MicroKit or anything like that, and hopefully soon everyone will just be able to use the mainline one. Um, and in the interest of transparency, I've made everything that I plan to upstream and the status of it, whether it has a PR, whether it's been merged and so on, um, available here. So if you want details, if you want to keep up to date with what's, what's going on, go visit there. So, what's next for MicroKit? Well, like I said, development is most certainly not done. Um, and the things I mentioned uh, on the previous slide, there's, there'll be more to come. Uh, but the past year, we've also been focusing a lot on enhancing the ecosystem. Um, so, I mentioned you can now create virtual machines with MicroKit, but you still need a virtual machine monitor to actually manage that. Um, proper debugging support to avoid just printf debugging everywhere, uh, performance profiling and system visualization tools. So like uh, was mentioned yesterday at the NCSC keynote, um, one of the nice properties of CampKeys, I guess it has a visualization tool. I have started to think about and implement one of those for uh, MicroKit as well. Um, and the last thing I wanted to mention is that we're building a non-trivial example system using MicroKit, so a POS system, which is what Gernot mentioned yesterday. Um, this will allow us to see, basically, um, or test that this is, uh, there are, I guess, no gaps in all the infrastructure we're building around MicroKit. Um, yeah. Um, so we've got a nice 3D printed case there. Um, anyways, I'll find out more about that next year, I guess, once we actually have it ready. Um, so the status of virtual machines on MicroKit, so why would you need a virtual machine? Uh, our main use cases are to avoid porting existing or implementing new device drivers. Um, for example, like a Bluetooth stack or a GPU driver, you probably don't want to implement that yourself. Um, the other use case is in invoking legacy software, say, you know, only runs on a certain operating system and it's massive, you don't want to port it to SEL4. Um, so the main goals are, I guess, pretty obvious as well. Um, we want secure and performant virtual machines as well. But similar to the, the whole point of MicroKit, um, I want to lower the barrier to entry for using virtual machines with, with SEL4, since it's such a, a common path for people building on SEL4. Um, so having documentation and lots of examples is a real priority, uh, even though we're still experimenting it. So for example, we have a manual for the system programmers in the audience. A manual is a document that describes how to use a project and like what <laughs> kind of features it has. I know it's a pretty crazy idea, but yeah. Um, so one of the main things about the VMM is that it is implemented as a library. So Previously, I've seen uh, a one-size-fits-all kind of VMMs on um, SEL4. These, I don't think, are ideal for all use cases. Um, they tend to be restrictive because, um, again, they're trying to abstract over all use cases, which is quite hard to do correctly. And so um, instead of trying to do that, um, the library, uh, the VMM library allows people to build their own VMM and use their own control flow and basically opt in to the things that the VMM library um, provides, right? Um, so in 
the MicroCare context, you'd have a VMM as a PD. It has its own net notified and protected and so on, and it's calling into the library, right? The library isn't providing these procedures it's itself. Um, this supports AS64 right now, risk five in progress. Um, X86 is planned if I can be bothered. Um, there are examples of using the VMM library in C, Zig, and Rust already, just to show kind of, I guess, the versatility of it and try have different build systems using it and so on to, to really show people like how to get started. Um, I've got some line counts here. I don't think these matter too much, to be honest. I wouldn't put too much emphasis on it, given how much is still developing around the VMM. But I did want to stress that um, it doesn't depend on any other libraries. It doesn't depend on any libc or anything like that. Um, so one of the ways um, that we often use uh, VMs at TS is for you know pass-through devices, leveraging device drivers that already exist in something like Linux, right? Um, so the easiest way to get I/O in a virtual machine is using pass-through, right? So this is uh, an example here. Uh, we have a VMM and a single guest and some, say, Linux user program uh, that wants to use particular functionality, like, you know, let's say networking. Um, there's a network driver already in Linux for my particular platform. What I do is I just give the guest full access to the, you know, in this case, Ethernet device. Um, this is pretty trivial in MicroKit, is just creating a memory region and mapping it like as if you had a native PD driver. Um, and of course, there's some extra stuff with, you know, actually processing the hardware interrupts up the chain to eventually get to the guest. Um, but obviously this isn't ideal when you want to share the actual device, um, which I imagine is a common use case. Uh, so for this, we're addressing this by extending and using the STDF transport layer. Um, so say if you had multiple clients of a single uh, driver VM. So um, here we have a native client as well as some legacy code in a guest kernel, right? Um, so both of these are going to try to access the same driver, um, and we can do so via STDF um, to say a multiplexer, which then actually talks to the driver. And a nice property of this is that because of the standard interfaces of STDF, we could, um, in theory, later on, let's say you think this driver is not performant or not reliable enough, you can replace it with a native, uh, a native driver and have you know, all the clients not, not have to change or anything. Um, so for this, uh, we're currently working towards doing this for graphics um, and networking support, um, 2D graphics. Um, so to summarize, um, the current state, I would say, of the VMM stuff is that it's sufficient for development and experimentation. I wouldn't say it's production ready yet. I wouldn't say people go out and use it in their systems. Um, we really need a proper performance and security analysis of it. Um, and features that I believe people use quite a lot are SMP guess, um, as well as obviously VertIO backends. Um, these are still in progress and aren't, aren't fully done. Um, one point I did want to stress, though, was that uh, the library itself depends on very few SEO4 invocations, which means that it wouldn't be too hard to actually bring this library in um, to another environment or change the library such that it actually is agnostic to whatever SEO4 environment it is. Um, so this is something I'd be keen to discuss with other people with their OS frameworks is um, trying to have you know, at least one maybe standard VMM um, uh, and then having people implement like a layer where they, for, for whatever framework they're using. Moving on to proper debugging. So right now, when running on real hardware, so not QMU, uh, using only printf debugging is pretty limiting. It's the only thing you can do right now, really, um, to you know, check the state of a program, where it's failing, and so on. So how do programmers, uh, systems programmers, debug stuff in 2023? Well, they use a technology from uh, 1980s. It's called GDB. Um, this we, want, we want to be able to add GDB support to MicroKit and have been doing so to set breakpoints both in software and hardware. Um, single step code, so once you set a breakpoint, then you know, keep going line by line to inspect the state and so on. Uh, we want to 
as well inspect kernel state, so dumping a C space and so on. Uh, also, it'd be ideal, um, especially for C, uh, Rust, it seems like there's support for it already, but for C to provide stack traces for faults. So let's say you have a memory fault. Uh, right now, all you'll get is a dump of the registers and a program, like, you know, what address it's failed at. Um, uh, that doesn't really mean much, you know, it doesn't tell you where it, where, it, where it came from, you know, what kind of behavior instigated that uh, virtual memory fault. Um, and so eventually we want an architecture like this where we have, you know, someone on their host system has GDB running on their laptop or their development machine or whatever, and then via, you know, a, a method of their own choosing like serial or the network, they connect to their target system um, so this would be via STDF drivers that talk to GDB sub that talks to ACL4 and allows you to debug your buggy code. Um, again, this is a work in progress. So the current state is it works with multiple prediction domains uh, and we can do breakpoints and single stepping and such, but um, having this cool architecture is still a bit away. So the last uh, part of the ecosystem that I'm going to talk about is the performance profiler. Um, so current profiling on SU4 is a bit limited. Um, it's good for getting an idea of cache misses, kernel entries, and so on, um, some diagnostics like that. But for non-trivial systems, you need a bit more of a systematic way of tracking performance. So the goal here is to have a statistical sampling um, user-level profiler to track performance of each PD in the system. So what this means, what I mean by statistical sampling is that the rest of the system stays the same. You invoke the profiler and it can then track all the data and export it to some tools that then you do analysis on um, rather than like, um, uh, what is it, code int uh, interest instrumentation, uh, which is where you recompile all your binaries and they're the ones that are actually you know, checking how many times is this function called and so on. So we're not doing that approach. We're doing a statistical sampling approach. Um, yeah, so we want to be able to use existing tools such as Perf and export a standard data format that they understand. Um, and, you know, again, like GDB, hook it up to STDF so that um, people can choose how they want their data exported by serial, network, or block, or whatever. Um, one potential problem with this that I like to discuss with people is that the, there are kernel changes required to enable this. Um, the ideal experience would be you have a deployed uh, um, you know, real-world system, and then you just go in and attach a profiler to it, and you can actually see you know, in real time what's going on um, because you know, it's a real deployed system. You have the real data there. Um, if you need to have special kernel changes to enable profiling, then you now need to have you know, a certain um, build of the kernel and you know, which you can't, you might, might not be able to deploy if it's not verified and so on. Um, so this is something that we still have to think about. Um, yeah, again, this is working where we can start experimenting with it, but it's, it's not ready for release. The last point I wanted to make is not a technical one, and it's about how, as, I guess, a research institution and the main developers of MicroCut, there are only so many use cases we can consider. Um, this means that, you know, especially since the project is not fully mature and not fully done, um, we're bound to miss some use cases, and there may still be holes. Um, in addition, you know, while we're trying to give users of MicroCut the best user experiences, um, there will almost certainly be gaps and mistakes. Um, so, you know, this can range from you know documentation issues, so simple spelling mistakes and so on, to you know insufficient error messages, to more you know design issues or um, the whole workflow. Um, so what I really want to stress is that it's vital for the community using our software to give us feedback and tell us what needs improving, right? Um, I'm very happy to fix stuff, um, but if you don't tell us what's wrong, we, we can't, <laughs> we're probably not going to be able to fix it. Um, and so that's something I'd really like to encourage. I've seen people do that so far, and it's great, and it's really helpful. So it's the last point I wanted to make. Um, if you're interested in getting hands-on experience with MicroKit. There's my tutorial tomorrow that you're welcome to come along. That's all. Thanks. Uh, we have some time for questions. 
And I think Iho is first. Um, you mentioned in stuff that you've been working on and that's kind of working dynamism. Mm -hmm. Can you explain a bit more about that, how your approach works? So the way it works um, like on a technical level is that you can specify what's called a root PD that has access to the TCB of a child PD, right? So it has the ability to you know, set the program counter um, uh, as well as, yeah, so basically um, with the program counter you're able to, you know, I guess, stop it, restart it, um, as well as late load it. The problem is um, there's no kind of, I guess, first class way where you'd um, say clear the whole ALF, you know, to get rid of any global state or something. That's something we still have to solve. Thanks. Nice. Hey, thanks for this. Um, sorry if I missed this. Is uh, MicroKit for mainline kernel, MCS, both? Uh, it's for MCS right now. Um, whether to add non-MCS support is uh, something I am considering, but yeah. If people complain about it, then maybe that would help the case. <laughs> no. What do you say, Gavin? If there is demand, please. <coughs> yeah. So, um, why did you go for something complicated and ugly like XML instead of something simple like JSON? Uh, you might want to repeat the question for the video. Uh, yeah, okay, right. So, the question I think was why not go for something simple like JSON and instead of something complicated like XML? Right, okay. Okay, well, I mean, really, the, the XML passes are not trustworthy? No, no. All right. can, well, can you trust, well, sorry, I mean, you can't trust any of the passes, but like, I, I wouldn't assume it'd be much better on JSON. So the, I guess the XML you're using. Sorry, I guess the XML you're using for the, uh, MicroKit <laughs> is a, s a fairly small subset of XML, and it's not, not that hard to parse. But right. if you use a general purpose XML parser, like Google for vulnerabilities of XML parsers, there is like, it, it's big. <laughs> okay, I wasn't so, aware of that. It wasn't my decision to use XML, um, but I will have to look into that then. Um, yeah, thanks for bringing that up. Yeah. It's purely syntactic with things that could be changed. So. Yeah. Um, the main the main point is that it's just something that's easy to pass and auto generate, um, and not too hard to write manually. Um, so if there's something else that fits that and is a lot more suitable, then we could switch to something like that. Okay, thanks. A quick question, right here. Yes. Uh, how uh, MicroKit and the Rust libraries? How are they licensed? Uh, MicroKit is BSD. Um, I assume Rust is the same. Nick. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, I think it's BSD2. Yeah. All right, I think we're at the end of the session, and I don't believe there's any photos before lunch. <laughs> and, and so now it's lunchtime. Until 1.30.